Thank you very much for that introduction. We're going to cover a lot of ground, so I'm going to jump right in. The topic that I've been kind of stumbling toward without realizing it the last three or four years uh, when I revamped the current brief, um, which I've had for almost 20 years now, and it's just constantly been evolving. Uh, the last uh, year or so, I've been revamping this one in this direction and didn't quite have a name for it because I wasn't quite sure what the hell I was describing. I just felt like these were the most important things to talk about. And I kept kind of waiting for a response from audiences that would clue me in as to, you know, what exactly was my big point. Uh, and I finally have kind of settled on this, imagining America's post-oil grand strategy. Now that's not a subject I've embraced particularly well in the past, the notion that the only reason why we're in the Middle East is because of oil. My argument there had always been the only reason we're in the Middle East is because the Middle East only has oil. That's its only connectivity with the world. And because it is, it's subject to transnational actors doing all sorts of mischief and creating problems there. Uh, but I'd argued for years that we hadn't really been that dependent on Middle Eastern oil. A hard sell for most people, the assumption being America's economy runs strictly on oil. We get all of it from overseas and almost all of it comes from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. That's why when they call the White House, we jump. None of that true, but it really took kind of the awareness of the shale gas tight oil revolution in the United States to kind of make this a more acceptable subject. And it's interesting now to see Obama in his last couple of years kind of, I don't, I don't know if it's consciously or unconsciously embrace some of the bravado that I think is going to be in American foreign policy going forward because we don't see ourselves anymore dependent on this role of defending the Middle East. So that's the subject I'm going to address in a variety of directions, and I'm going to make an argument um, as such. We have a tendency to think of the world like this. You know, we spread it out, and because we read from left to right, we tend to think kind of from left to right or right to left, but in a horizontal method. And there's good reasons for that. The great integration during the Cold War was transatlantic. At the end of the Cold War, the next great sensed integration within the global system was Trans-Pacific. The incredible rise of Asia, the original avatar being Japan, then China, um, and that being kind of under the radar because of 9-11 across the last decade, we bump into this notion that we've been talking about for quite some time and start to realize that the integration between the United States and China is profound and vast. It hasn't permeated, I would argue, the US national security establishment, which tends to still see the possibility of war isolated with China, isolated from the rest of the planet, the global economy, our larger relationship. And that's a problem. It's also a problem I find inside of China, which is why I'm interested in working for them. But an acceptance now of this grand integration scheme that's unfolded for the last 25 years. But in both instances, kind of a longitudinal perspective. And the argument really has a strong basis in history. If you think back to your Jared Diamond, it's that notion that where it is wide, things, ideas, plants, civilizations can spread with ease, and where it's tall, it's more difficult. One of the most fascinating arguments I've ever bumped into. So his argument was basically, this is where the empires were formed because of the strengths allowed to develop within civilizations, and this is where we talk about native peoples still to this day because over time, those indigenous populations were largely obliterated by the movement of colonists to those areas. So the advantage of being wide versus tall. So I'm going to make the argument here that we are going to find ourselves more and more talking about and embracing a latitudinal perspective. And not only us, but the Chinese as well. And it goes in both directions, south and north, 
for these reasons, developments in energy, developments in food, developments in climate change, developments in demographics. And then I'm going to toss out what I call two great curveballs on this. The danger of situations developing between the United States and China, and what happens during this interregnum where the United States is no longer willing to play Leviathan in the Middle East, and China is nowhere near ready to play Leviathan in the Middle East. First, I'm going to make the argument about American grand strategy, just so you know where I'm coming from. I'm going to talk about the American system as states uniting, economies integrating, the notion of collective security. All the states come together and have a collective security. They encourage network transaction growth. If we actually tracked foreign direct investment between or among California, Texas, Minnesota, Massachusetts, in the same way that we track it between Germany, France, Italy, and whatnot, of course, we'd be the center of foreign direct investment around the world because we've been doing this for a couple hundred years. That creates two important things, a competitive religious landscape. Americans change their religion more frequently than any society in the world at zero penalty. And then a political pluralism based around a unifying middle class ideology currently under assault. The top line here I describe as the easy parts of globalization. That's what gets you rich. The harder parts are dealing with the cultural implications, a lot of which revolve around traditional patriarchal societies, male control over female, religion, and the whole definition of family procreation. But what I'm arguing is America is the world's first and most successful multinational union. We tend to forget that until we have something like the 2000 election, and then we say, my God, is that actually how you do things in Florida? We are, in effect, globalization in miniature. Longest running regime without disruption currently in the system, oldest in terms of the entire globalization experience, and a major exporter of that experience in the form of this brilliant fella and the international liberal trade order, his new deal for the world, that he pushed out the door before he died. That created, just among the West, the embryonic core, the kernel code for what we now call globalization. It was enormously successful. It starts to attract the emulation of the East. That integrates China tipping point achieved, we start talking about a global economy for the first time, and then we come up with this phrase, globalization. I'm telling you, that was a strategy going all the way back to FDR's cousin, Teddy Roosevelt, McKinley, that crew. It was never about spreading democracy, it was about creating open doors and trusting everything else would follow. And when we've got in trouble, historically, is when we reverse that order when we go anti-Marxian and say it's all about politics to create the economics. When we know from our own history and the world's history, it's all about the economics to create the politics. What we accomplished, the great divergence that occurred as Europe in various guises over hundreds of years tried to run the international system. They got very wealthy in the process. The rest of the world got ripped off. So Niall Ferguson and his sale of the benevolence of the British Empire, to me, complete and utter nonsense on several levels. Interesting, when the US comes along and takes control of the system, sets in motion this globalization of an entirely new order, and what it makes possible is what we now describe as the great convergence, the rest catching up dramatically with the West. And oh, how we fear that success story. But this is the amazing thing going on in the system right now. About 70 million added to a global middle class every year, to the point where we could already describe a global middle class that is more than half the world's population. 
And I'm not talking about the American middle class from the 1950s. High school education, blue collar job, make it all the way to retirement just fine. I'm talking about anybody who's got extra money, disposable income to spend. More like an American middle class from 1890, 1900, 1910. Back when Sears Roebuck pioneered this crazy idea of selling you a house in a box. They ship it to you, you slap it together yourself. China now 3D prints houses in a very similar development. So that's how we got to this point of great success.